Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Canada Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel, and this is UFO USO UAP class number three. And we're making good progress. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about USOs, underwater submerged objects. And some of the more notable cases in that genre. But before we get into that deep talk, topic for today. It's been a lot of conversation and you've asked many times about what do I use for optics? Well, I've gone through a lot. <laughs> a lot. And I've had some good friends give me some really good things and I've been very fortunate. Let's talk about binoculars for a second. Now, these are some pristine optics. Swarovskis. Uh, these are 10 by 42s. Now, a key to optics is the quality of the glass and the lens gathering ability of the glass. So when you look through it, it's late in the afternoon, and you're looking through some cheap optics, it's going to be pretty dark outside. And if you're looking through some real good ones, it has real good light gathering, it's going to look a lot brighter than normal. And the clarity of the glass is kingdom. Now, a lot of people know this, I won't buy anything from China. These are made in Austria. These are some of the more expensive binoculars out there in the market. And I don't say you have to buy these. Now these were uh, a gift from somebody very nice and I've had them for a long time. Now, Swarovski makes a pair of binoculars that are about half the size that are great for backpacking. And the optics on them are outstanding as well. But there are some binoculars out there that have an adjustment inside. So when you're not quite as steady as some, that they'll balance the view you have through the binoculars. It's kind of cool. And uh, those are nice as well. And then there's some binoculars out there that have a camera built in. So when you're looking through the binoculars, you can take a picture. I don't, I don't use those, but binoculars are key. And almost everywhere I am, I have a good pair of binoculars with me, whether it's in my car, in my backpack, on my boat, wherever I've got a good pair of binoculars. Now the real key to what I do is in the night vision scope I have, this is what it looks like. It's a little tiny thing. It's a monocle. And you look through this end right here. This is the back end. I'm not going to turn it on right now because you don't turn it on during the daytime. And this, because of the quality of the light gathering, this will make a, a midnight sky with no moon and you're looking at stars. It'll be bright out, very bright. And that is the key, the clarity and the brightness. Now this is a, made by a company called A. T-N, like Adam, Tom, Nora. And it's a PVS, like a Paul Victor Sam 14-4 monocle. Now these have come down, they're about half the price they were seven or eight years ago. Right now that monocle is about $5,000. And when I have people over to our house, Angie and I almost always get the monocle out and we go out in the backyard and we just sit there and people are mesmerized because when you look at the sky normally with just the naked eye, you see maybe one five hundredth of what you see when you look through that monocle. It's like, whoa, <laughs> you didn't even know that was all there. And uh, I do have a device magnifying device that's made by ATN that goes on the end of this that actually enhances the view two times. 
and uh, yeah, it makes it twice as cool. I have seen things with that monocle that defy anyone's belief system about UFOs. And I've had people over to the house and I've showed that to them and they're blown away and they're speechless because of what we can see through that. Now, it's also very cool, and I've done this many times, is taking it camping. And the amount of wildlife you can see with that is, <laughs> is really fun. Uh, again, when you're looking through the forest floor with the monocle, it kind of looks like you're looking through it during daytime. Uh, the, the distance you can see with that isn't nearly what you can see in the daytime with a good pair of binoculars, but you can still see a lot. Now, the, the night vision is different than FLIR forward-looking infrared radar. Now, FLIR is a heat-gathering device. That's what you see these Bigfoot shows using a lot of the times. I truly don't understand why they're not using night vision other than it's expensive. And this little thing right here, if I dropped it on the floor, five grand out the window, it's not real durable. And I'm very careful with it but this is the exact monocle that many special forces around the world use in wartime and war zones now that's a generation four and you can buy that generation four on the atn site now there's a generation five and six and i would love to look through those but they're not even available to look at through the for the general public but those really take ufo viewing to a whole different level whole different level and uh, it's expensive but it's probably one of the most fun little tools and toys that I have and uh, a lot of what I've written about in the past comes because of what I've seen through that thing so a little bit about binoculars and night vision you can buy it online not a big deal ATN PVS 14.4 Okay, now we're gonna talk about some current events. Now this is this month's MUFON magazine. Now, many of you know, I'm gonna be in Ocala, Florida in a couple weeks speaking at a Bigfoot conference, but I am also a keynote speaker at this year's International Symposium in Kentucky, Cincinnati, Ohio, right, ne right on the river there. The event's in Kentucky, but it's really just across the river from Cincinnati. It's in late September, MUFON Symposium. If you just Google MUFON National Symposium, you'll see I'm there. I'm actually the keynote speaker at the banquet Friday night. That's a great position, and I'm humbled that I was asked to do it. So that'll be fun. Now, Fact. <laughs> on the back of the magazine there is this about the symposium and one of the speakers all right now always at the beginning of the MUFON magazine they have a I like this part they have kind of the new newest UFOs that have been seen and one of them is pretty interesting to me. I'll read, I'll read you the case file on it. It says, Flying object videoed flying over UK. In West Sussex, UK, a man reported seeing an object that had flashing lights, according to testimony. He took video of it, and an image of the object taken from the video appears above. Now, this is what it looks like. Kind of strange looking. Not your standard everyday UFO. In fact, it kind of looks like a satellite, but that's not what it is. Thursday, 19th of January, 2023, you need to bear in mind 
This is the view from directly below and then behind as it gets further away. I was out in the back garden having a smoke and I'm looking up at the stars because it's a clear sky and I have a huge fascination with everything spatial related. A few minutes go by and I look up to the south direction because I notice that these lights are coming towards my house going north and I see the shape of it. Then initially thought it's a stealth bomber, which I've never seen in flight. So I grabbed my phone and started recording. Then I was watching all the lights and the sequential flashing. I thought this can't be any civilian or military craft with that many lights flashing in that order and almost a diamond delta shape. Anyway, following it, it but have a walk around the back of the house while looking at the object, noticing the big lights, which started off as frosty white blue, ended up as warm red orange with a red light in the front center. Then back inside about an hour went past. It was bothering me that this thing could be, and it didn't look normal. When I zoomed in on one frame, you can clearly make out intelligently designed right angles all over the surface and around the lights. Yeah, true. It looks like the cockpit of a Millennium Falcon with two parallel strips of something green, and the object looks kind of like a diamond from what I can make out. UK MUFON director Robert Young closed this case as an unknown aerial vehicle. Next one, subject photographed above Texas. In Blossom, Texas, a woman reported sighting a number of objects that had lights and were flying out in the sky. The witness was outside her house with her dogs at 9.59 p.m. on December 25th, 2022, when the incident began. She took some pictures and a video of the object, a crop version of the photos appear, and also provided an audio file. Texas MUFON State Director Roy Schaffel closed the case as an unknown aerial vehicle. That's kind of what it is right here. Bright object in the sky photographed over Costa Rica. Costa Rican man who had made earlier CMS filings reported he saw a bright aerial reflection that caused his attention according to testimony. He took photos of the object which had a watery heading. One of the pictures had been reproduced above. The witness was outside at 4.23 p.m. December 28th. In his short description of the event, the witness reports explained that a small bright reflection caught my attention, grabbed a 500 millimeter F8 manual focus lens and took photos. That's a good lens, by the way, really good. Objects seemed to flip over with the wind. After one or two minutes, it lost sight. Costa Rica MUFON International Director Fred Kohler closed the case unknown aerial vehicle. That's it right there. It's a pretty good picture, I gotta say. One of the better ones I've seen in MUFON. A couple more here. Blurry object photographed over Alabama at about 423 on January 2023. 20, a woman in Boaz, Alabama was outside her house with her phone when her young granddaughter approached asking if she would take a picture of an object in the sky. Not having seen it earlier, the witness then observed an unusual white object crossing the sky in a straight line. Alabama, Puerto Rico, near water. Pay attention. That's what the object looked like that they photographed. Spherical object photograph over Mississippi. <laughs> Water. In Biloxi, Mississippi, a woman outside her house reported seeing what appeared to be two silver spheres flying in the sky, according to her testimony. The incident began 4.58 p.m. February 6, <coughs> 2023. Witnesses in the backyard her description of the event edited for clarity. As I'm taking pictures of my dog, I see off in the distance two tre above trees, two silver reflective aluminum looking objects flying parallel to each other. I thought that looked very strange. I was steadily snapping photos back to back of my dog, trying to get her to, to look my way. Sure enough, after seeing the cap, the capturing the objects in the photo, and the tree lines, I just look up and right above my neighbor's house, I can see clear as day, two silver aluminum looking spheres. This is not a bad picture either. There, there. So, I'm giving you a little insight as to really 
what this MUFON journal is about. And they always start off with a couple of things just like I told you, some sightings. Then they have some investigative stories and then they talk about uh, the need every, every time a need for MUFON investigators. And uh, yeah, it's a good magazine. I can't wait to get it every month. It's one of the main reasons why I pay the fee. So I'm going to start off with uh, some recent letters. I live here in Salem, Oregon, and I just ordered your Bigfoot stuff, and we'll order the 411, uh, 411 books next payday. I've watched all your movies multiple times. Missing 411 UFO connection is great, one of the best. Missing 411 the UFO connection, watch it on Amazon. Blu-ray or DVD, you buy it from me at our website, NA, like North America, NABigfootSearch.com. I watch your channel and leave it running in the background often. Oh, thank you. The more you leave that running, it's better for us on YouTube. So, appreciate it. I consider myself knowledgeable in U on UFOs and Bigfoot and so on. I am an RN working on my master's degree in nursing informatics, which is IT. Question, there's a company that offers paranormal, non-educational certified degrees in ufology and cryptozoology. Do you know, are they worth taking? Even just for fun, they're about 1500 bucks each. Or is joining MUFON a better option? $1,500 each? I just gave you a whole master's degree in Bigfoot in 20 episodes for free. <laughs> uh, I've never heard of this. I would, I don't know, non-educational certified degrees. What is that? I check into who's doing the classes. You should be able to uh, get a copy of the class format before you engage, see what they're going to talk about. Or is MUFON a better option? Well, MUFON, you can move it along at your own pace. They have investigator classes and they have books that teach you how to be an investigator. So, I don't know. I'd recommend taking that online Bigfoot class from, uh, what is it? Dave Politis. Yeah. I was in the U.S. Air Force for 11 years in EOD. And I saw several UFOs and some classified stuff. I was in corrections for eight years and saw many paranormal ghost sightings here or there in Eastern Oregon Correctional Facility in Pendleton and at Salem Hospital where I work now. Also, I've had several religious and spiritual events I can share later if you're interested. I had a Bigfoot sighting in high school, even reported it. It was high above Ashland, Oregon, above Lithia Park in the Watershed area. We hiked up to the top of the peak called Bobcat Point, took a lunch, we were kids, so we did not take any guns. And as we sat to eat, we heard a growl of some kind. And I was a skinny, scared kid, and I said, hey, what is that? We then heard another deep growl, bushes shaking, etc. I laughed, ran down the hill, looking back. For years, I wonder, should I have waited a few more seconds? Or could I have become one of the missing? I know it looks weird, but 20 minutes to run down at full speed. You're a good man, and I try to get my friends to watch your YouTube channel. I subscribe and watched a lot. I wanted to tell you a few more things. Okay, here we go. My brother-in-law was hunting elk in eastern Oregon, and they filmed a video of UFO followed by jets. It was a triangle with a red in the middle and three white lights. You cannot see it well, but you can hear the hum of the jets. I'm trying to get the tape of them send to you so I told him I bet you have access to ways to enhance the video. If you find the bad UFO commentary from the 70s they show a similar triangle in a sighting that they show on a I'm not sure if you're aware of the UFOs you show in the same as a famous Belgian UFO sighting. The famous Belgium UFO sighting is a little different. Not quite the same. It's close. But not quite. Orbs and UFOs. 
In the U.S. Air Force, while stationed in Nevada, my friends and I saw a UFO while at the mailbox in Nevada near Alamo, which is a good viewpoint for seeing Area 51. The item did a 180 degree turn in the sky and lit up very brightly. We also took some of our shop night vision gear out another time and saw a light move around the ridges to go to Area 51. We also took some of our shop night vision. Was it that good? I've seen jets at new, near supersonic. This was quadruple that speed at an estimated distance. There was no sound at all, no sonic boom, nothing. Orbs, while working in the Eastern Oregon Correctional Facility in Pendleton at about 4 a.m., the officer outside was walking the fence line doing security checks. I was inside the building looking out the window on the second floor. He was about 50 feet outside the building. He walked under a tree and a white orb the size of a beach ball in relationship to the size of his head came from the tree and zigzagged and went into the ground behind him. I thought, what did I just see? An owl or something? Trying to come up with a rational reason for the orb, but it glowed like a lit light bulb or globe. Why go into the ground? There are tunnels all around the prison, a basement level, which is for emergencies. I had many of those events happen. We had a phone to talk on and stay awake on night shift. While several of us were talking, an officer on the west side of the fourth floor saw an orb or bright light. It was about the same time in the morning weeks later that I saw. He said the orb became a woman in a white dress and stopped and went through the floor. The sergeant said, oh, he was sleeping and it blew it off. We were all awake and talking. The prison is split to east and west by the dining hall. By the end of the breakfast the next morning, every inmate on the whole prison heard about this. <laughs> uh, I have no doubt. Hey Dave, five-year follower, thank you for bringing so much light. You wanted orb stories. I know I'm late, but it takes me a while to regroup mentally after revisiting these experiences. I'll keep it short. Setting, 1965 San Bernardino, LA area. On a cul-de-sac, major construction. Street is North Leroy Street. Note, <coughs> notes, Vietnam War time. <coughs> Kiwis flew over the house on a constant basis, heading to March Air Force Base. My dad was military, actively serving at the time. <clears throat> he was USC Recon Special Expeditionary Force. Mother has always been terrified of rainstorms, especially with thunder and lightning, and I mean absolutely terrified. It's a bright summer afternoon, a couple of Kiwis had flown over. I had a kinship to them, and I was on military bases a lot. All of a sudden, for no reason I can remember, my mother called us inside. It seemed a rather instantaneous change of occurring. I remember the clouds turning gray rather quickly. The sun completely disappeared, and a light rain began to fall. It took me longest to get back in the house because I was at the edge of the yard. By the time I got into the small covered front porch, it was sprinkling. As I recall, heavy thunderstorms and cloudbursts. My siblings had already gone inside and closed the door just before I got to the concrete slab on the porch. It's, I stopped. I love the rain. I remember clearly in little girl fashion, standing, fancying the front door. I couldn't resist the raindrops. I barely got a 180 degree turn in and I was facing the driveway. I don't know where it came from, how it got there, but probably not 10 feet away from me was a silver orb. Not quite as big as a basketball. It was completely mesmerizing. Behind me, I heard my mom pounding on the window, yelling at me to come in right now. I could hear her, but I could not move. Could not break the haze on the ball. No markings like a giant ball bearing, but it was slowly spinning and rain was still light. My arms, was, my arms were still spread out, my gaze unbroken. I could hear my mom screaming, but it was like my head was in the state just before you pass out, kind of dizzy, not clear. I wanted to go inside, but I literally could not move. I heard the front door open, and my mom was frantic, screaming and crying. She ran up behind me, grabbed me from under my arms. They were still spread out from twirling like a fairy dance, and had to drag me back inside. I was still in a trance. She dragged me in. I saw a bolt of lightning. It was not jagged. It was a straight line. 
and I cannot say whether it came from the orb or from the sky above it, but it seemed to shout out or shoot out directly upon from the top of the orb and then the orb was gone. It didn't move in any direction, it just vanished. The rain only continued for a couple more hours and then the afternoon. I asked my mom, what was that thing? And she said, ball lightning. It's very dangerous, you must never go outside in the rain. I asked her how lightning could just be in a silver ball and she maintained, it's ball lightning. It's a special kind of lightning, it's rare. But she was troubled. I didn't believe her, I could still remember because I knew somewhat in my unconscious, just paralyzed, she grabbed me from behind. She knew what this thing was and felt that. She was so frightened of it. Reminiscing about this event made me realize there's most likely a certain connection between her and thunderstorms. All those years, I never understood how someone could be so afraid of the rain, thunder, and lightning. I believe I found a connection. Yeah, it's quite a story. Now, Water covers approximately 70% of the Earth's surface. It's an area that isn't researched much anymore. Back in the 60s, 50s, 70s, there was a lot of research. And then all of a sudden, it kind of stopped, which is pretty weird. So the very depths of oceans are rarely entered into these days. And it's almost as though if something wanted to live down there, then they probably would never be hassled. So we have UFOs, and the, those are talked about a lot. But really, USOs, un, underwater submerged objects, aren't talked about that much. Now, David Fravor, who was with the Nimitz Battle Group, a Navy pilot, who was dispatched to check out a UFO off the coast of Baja, California. He arrives and he sees an object almost in the water. And one object is in the water, just under the surface, and another is just above it, hovering. So you've got an underwater submerged object and then you've got a standard UFO above it. It's a very famous case. Now, why do I bring that up? Because that, that entire event just boggles the mind about how it could happen. But if UFOs are as advanced as they appear to be, now there's some people that say, well, Dave, you know, these are just advanced technologies that we have and we shouldn't even be worried about it. It's nothing, nothing mysterious about it. So flying through the sky is one thing. Flying through the ocean, that's another. Ocean is much more dense. It's very difficult to move water out of your way. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of fuel. And the speed that conventional craft can go through water versus air entirely different game. Now we have some submarines that are fairly quick, but not nearly as what's been reported by Navy personnel about what they've seen go past them in the water. And we're going to talk about some of these things. First one, U.S. submarine hits underwater object in the South China Sea. Well, I never heard about that, Dave. This is CNN, October 7, 2021. A U.S. nuclear-powered submarine struck an underwater object in the South China Sea on Saturday, according to two defense officials. A number of sailors on board the USS Connecticut were injured in the accident. None of the injuries were life-threatening, according to the Pacific Fleet. It's unclear what the Sea Wolf-class submarine may have hit while it was submerged. Hmm. Now, submarines have something very similar to what we have on airplanes on radar. They can detect things in front of them. 
and they always know the contour of the ocean that they're in. Let's say if there's a mountain coming up, underwater mountain ahead of them, they'll see it and they'll know it's there. So what could they have hit? The submarine remains in a safe and stable condition. USS Connecticut's nuclear propulsion plant and spaces were not affected and remain fully operational. The incident will be investigated. The Navy did not specify the incident took place in the South China Sea, only that it occurred in international waters in the Indo-Pacific region. <laughs> yeah. It did go back and it did go through a maintenance overhaul after that. So it hit something pretty substantial to injure people. It's a website called EMN, July 28, 2021. Yes, underwater UFOs are a thing and there's a bizarre history to them. In the first incident, the pilot saw a dark mass underwater as he and his team riveted or retrieved a flying practice drone. Pilot described the object as a big mass, kind of circular, and he was certain it wasn't a submarine in the pilot's second sighting, a practice torpedo, that the pilot was sent to recover was sucked down into the depths of the ocean in the presence of similar underwater object. The torpedo was never seen again. Elsewhere, Fravor, David Fravor, the commander of the uh, Nimitz Battle Group's Hornets fighters, reveals a 79-year-old woman contacted him after his sighting went public. The woman explained that her father, a naval officer, was at one time based at Naval Air Station San Francisco in the 50s. When she was a child, her father showed her a telegram that stated unidentified objects had been sighted going in and out of the water at a now forgotten set of latitude and longitude coordinates. The woman's father told her, we get these all the time and it's always in the same area. High performance target drone similar to that recovered, according to retired US Navy Fravor in, in that same area. These sightings are similar to Fravor's own sightings, according to the retired pilot. The only reason he had seen the now infamous Tic Tac UFO is because it was hovering above a mysterious larger object in the water. Fravor describes the object as cross-shaped and the size of a 737. He was Further described the water above it as though it was boiling or frothing and said the object appeared after it caught his attention. In 1970s, famous biologist Ivan Sanderson published the book Invisible Residence. Sanderson noted a student of unusual phenomena devoted the book to sightings of what were later identified as unidentified submerged objects or USOs. On the 19th of April, 1957, crew members above, aboard the Kitsukawa Maru, a famous Japanese fishing boat, spotted two metallic silvery objects descending from the sky and the sea. Original. The objects estimated to be 10 meters long were without wings of any kind. As it hit the water, they created a violent turbulence. Stop there. X-File Sands, famous story about the same incident. Famous story. It's a great, great X-Files show. Sanderson also reports an incident that reportedly took place off the coast of Puerto Rico in 63 during an anti-submarine warfare exercise. He stated that the maneuvers were conducted off Puerto Rico in the Atlantic, some 500 miles southeast of the continental U.S. All reports seem to agree there were five small naval vessels concerned. But in more than one account, the aircraft carrier WASP is stated to have been the command ship. A sonar operator on one of the small vessels, otherwise listed as a destroyer, reported to his bridge that one of the submarines had broken formation and gone off in what appeared to be pursuit of an unknown object. The operator did not, of course, know if this was a plant, since maneuvers they were engaged in were exercises to train personnel in detection. However, the operator's report was not all within the limits of any such simulation. Trouble was that said subcutaneous object was traveling at over 150 knots. Wow. Point, exclamation point. Uh, I don't know of anything in our military that can go 150 knots underwater. It is said that the technicians kept track of the object for four days and then it maneuvered around about into depths of 27,000 feet. Whew. 
The USS Wasp was indeed an anti-submarine warfare carrier in 63 and served as the Atlantic Fleet until decommissioned in 72. Unfortunately, Sanderson doesn't provide any sourcing for the incident, nor is there any other information about it posted on the internet. The National UFO Reporting Center maintains a database of sightings both by email and hotline. There are many reports of UFO objects seen coming out of or going into the ocean. Off the coast of Half Moon Bay, California, about 50 miles south of San Francisco, an eyewitness reported that in 2007 she observed three UFOs while aboard a cruise ship, Dawn Princess. After about five minutes, three softly glowing objects came into view. Three uniform, nearly spherical objects evenly spaced in a line parallel to the ship's hull and hovering just above the water surface. They appeared to stay in one place while the ship moved past them. They were hovering, but didn't disturb the water below. Just as they went out of my sight, the left one toward the bow splashed down in the water and disappeared. Now understand something. Our conventional propulsion systems most of the time involve moving a mass to go through it. So on planes we move air to go through the air. And then we push the air over the wing to cause a lift on the plane. Or in a helicopter we push the air down to pull the helicopter up. Moving through water is a different thing. Most of the old time submarines had a big prop at the back. They moved the water through. The design of the prop would be an indicator to others about the type of submarine that's moving through the area. There's a lot of top secret things about how we can move through the ocean silently now. Next one is a National Post article, September 21st, 2017. It says, we saw something, something came down. The famous Shag Harbor incident, 50 years after it happened. Shag Harbor. Where's that, Dave? So this is Nova Scotia. And for followers of Oak Island, Oak Island's right here, where that little dot is. This is Shag Harbor. This is Maine. This is the dividing line between Canada and the United States. Shag Harbor is very close to Oak Island. This incident is very important for a multitude of reasons, as you're going to find out. Shag Harbor. It's around 11 p.m. the night of October 4, 67. Most witnesses thought it was a doomed aircraft. Halifax. The first frantic callers to reach the RCMP were clear. Something had crashed in the waters off Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia. Among those who saw a string of flashing lights on that clear, moonless night were three RCMP officers, scores of fishermen and airline pilots flying along the province's rugged southwest coast. But a series of searches turned up nothing. No records, no bodies, no clues. To this day, I don't know the absolute answer, but we're still finding things. A Halifax area man later uncovered a trove of government and police records that make the Shag Harbor incident Canada's best documented and most intriguing UFO sighting. Hundreds of UFO sightings are reported across Canada every year, but none has the paper trail of Shag Harbor. Hold your taters. <laughs> if you've watched this, you have learned something about UFOs. In the movie, we interviewed a retired RCMP officer. RCMP is the national police for Canada. The closest thing we really have in the States to that is the FBI. But the RCMP are boots on the ground, standard police. And what she told us I didn't know anything about, and I didn't know any UFO MUFON investigators that knew this either. When an RCMP officer gets a report of a UFO, they drop everything, they focus 100% on the report, 
they write a report, and then it gets overnighted that next night to headquarters in Ottawa. Every report. They take it as a national urgent issue. Entirely different than the US. Isn't that weird? Now why don't we take it seriously and Canada does? Very odd. So this plays into this Halifax USO UFO. In a series of RCMP reports and correspondence sent by Telex between military officials in Ottawa and Halifax, there are specific references to unidentified flying objects and no attempts are made to explain away the people reporting. Chris Stiles, a UFO researcher who dug up those documents, remains baffled in this case. To this day, I don't know the absolute answer, but we're still finding things. Next week, on the eve of the 50th anniversary, Stiles will be the keynote speaker at the start of a three-day Shag Harbor UFO festival. After 20 plus years of dogged research, he says he has new evidence to share. It points to an explanation that hardly seems possible unless you have a sense of what Stiles has uncovered. To be sure, the most compelling evidence comes from eyewitnesses like Lori Wykins, now a 67-year-old former fisherman. There were four lights in a row. They were going on and off. There was four lights in a row and they were going on and off, said Wykins, and at the time a 17-year-old driving home to Shag Harbor with a friend and th with three young women, one would come on and two would, three would go off. And they'd all be off for a second and come back on. Sure, he was about to witness an airline disaster. Wickens found a phone booth, called RCMP detachment. Questions were asked about his sobriety, but he wasn't drunk. And he was sure about what he saw. Several other called the Mounties that night as well. They all said the same thing. Soon afterwards, Wykens was among a dozen or so people gathered at the water's edge, watching in amazement as a glowing orange sphere about the size of a city bus bobbed on the waves 300 meters from shore. At 11.20 p.m., it slipped underneath the surface without a sound. Three of those at the wharf were Mounties. One of them called the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax. A Coast Guard cutter was immediately dispatched to conduct a search. All I know is that we saw something and something came down. I can't prove it, but in my opinion, they found something. Before the ship arrived, volunteer searchers aboard two fishing boats soon spotted a long trail of bubbling yellow foam on the water's surface, but no wreckage. A squad of RCMP divers later failed to turn up any clues after a three-day scan of the harbor floor, according to mil official military records. Can you see how serious Canada takes this? That was a full-blown military response to people just watching something that they thought came into the water. I doubt if America would even do anything. To this day, Wykins has no idea what he saw. All I know is what we saw something and something came down, he says, adding that he believes the divers pulled something from the water, but I can't prove it. Wykins, now president of the Shag Harbor UFO Society, will take part in a panel discussion to include Ralph Lowinger, one of the pilots aboard a Pan Am Flight 160 and a Boeing 707 cargo aircraft at 33,000 feet the same night. Nobody reported a UFO, everybody reported a plane crash. <clears throat> that gives a, credit, uh, gives a boost of credibility to the story. Lowinger and other crew members never reported their sighting. Their story came to light about six years ago when Stiles tracked them down. What sets this story apart is that the impact was witnessed by several independent and credible witnesses, said Brock Zink, a Nova Scotia seafood buyer and VP of the Shag Harbor UFO Society. Nobody reported a UFO. Everybody reported a plane crash. 36 hours after the initial sighting, several Defense Department officials signed off on a memo that made it clear authorities had no idea what they were dealing with. A preliminary investigation has been carried out by the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax. It's been determined that the UFO sighting was not caused by a flare, float, aircraft, or in fact, any known object. At the time, the area was a location for a top-secret U.S. military base disguised as an oceanographic institute. The facility used underwater mics, etc., for magnetic detection. I interviewed anybody who was still alive 
Stiles said, I tracked him down, but the clues kept coming. During a recent search uh, of an island off Shag Harbor, Skiles says he spotted a military marker that indicated it was placed there by a staff from a fake institute in Shelburne, which means the U.S. military snoops had been there at some point. I'm not here to make believers, he says. Some people say I'm a believer. That's a bit of an exaggeration. I want the real answers. One of the best documented UFO, UFO, USO sightings of all time. Now, is it just a coincidence it's so close to Oak Island? I don't know. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that Oak Island doesn't want to talk about any of the UFO sightings around that area, and there are many. Sonfjord, Nor Norway. Now, if you're an older person, you might remember this. But all you young bucks out there, I doubt you're going to, but this is a really good one. Let's start with some of the facts. The fjord is the largest fjord in Norway, second largest in the world. It runs 127 miles long and heads inland to the town of Joden. Maximum depth, 4,291 feet, and that's far inland. Near the mouth of the fjord adjacent to the sea, there's still there is a sill rising the ocean floor that sits at 330 feet below sea level. Cliffs surrounding the fjord reach heights of 3,300 feet. The Norwegian Navy and some NATO forces were involved in a two-week long observation in pursuit of a USO beginning November 12th through November 22nd, 72. In all, about 30 naval vessels participated. Now this is the fjord. Starts out in the sea and goes inland. Now, this place is epically gorgeous. Here's a picture. Now, some of these cliffs go 3,300 feet straight down, and the depth of this is very deep. It's unclear how the incident began. Some say that it started with the sighting of a Russian U-boat submarine. Others say an unidentified craft was witnessed flying, then disappearing below the water's surface. Huh, flying and then disappearing below the water's surface. Maybe that's why Dave's reading this. On the 13th, two unidentified witnesses reported seeing a bright object on the water. On the water. Generally speaking, most reports say that a fast-moving vehicle was picked up, presumably on radar, off the coast of Norway. Remember, this was during the Cold War, and tensions were running high, especially towards the Soviet Union. Somewhere along the way, it entered the waters of the Sone Fjord, where the Norwegian Navy began to track it. A specialized subhunter helicopters even joined the fray. Soviet submarines or U-boats were previously seen in the fjord, in all areas around the Norwegian coastline. So the Navy was familiar with seeing them and trying to force them to the surface. To date, the Navy had been unable to force a U-boat to the surface. However, whatever data they collected from radar and sonar tracking of the USO remains top secret. I think what is clear is they soon learned it wasn't a Soviet submarine, but an unidentified craft. It wasn't until November 20th that it was seen on the surface of the water and described as a massive, silent, torpedo-shaped torpedo craft. The Navy fired at it, but it dove into the water again, so they fired depth charges at it to no avail. Nearing the end of the encounter, the Navy decided to blockade the fjord. Now, this is where the shallow depths of the mouth of the fjord play into this story. So they have this thing trapped up the fjord. They've got it trapped up in this area. There's only one way out, out through the ocean and through this shallower water here. So they blockade it. So now they got it up in this area somewhere. During the end of the encounter, the Navy decided to blockade the fjord. If there had been a Soviet vessel in the water, it would have been trapped. A craft could have also 
and it wouldn't a craft that could also fly would not have been trapped. At 1 p.m., a U-boat was seen heading toward Fjord's southern tip. Then 15 minutes later, five police officers saw it at Vamsoy, a small island 31 miles north of Krikjebo. If they were seeing the same object, it would have been able to travel 124 miles per hour, an impossible feat given the technology of the day. At the island, some frigate ships dropped mines on the USO seemingly without effect. Remember, in the Mermaids program, the Soviet submarines were tracking undersea objects traveling at 125 miles per hour, and they couldn't identify them. So folks, this is decades ago. 125 miles per hour under the water? That's bizarre, right? Now, I've heard these stories many times, but I'm just reading this to you so you can grab the magnitude of it. The night of the 21st, four witnesses saw four rockets shooting from the water at Hermanswerk. The rockets were silent and looked like small red balls of light. On the afternoon of the 22nd, the Navy fired an anti-submarine missile at the intruders. At that point, the water's depth was 82 feet, so it would have caused a tremendous shockwave from there up to 10 miles away. A conventional submarine would have been severely damaged and required to surface. The craft being tracked was unscathed. Throughout this two-week episode, reports came in of aircraft experiencing unexplained electronic problems. Yellow and green objects were seen flying along a mountainside. Navy vessels registered sonar contact with something in the deep water. Surveillance craft witnessed unidentified objects that executed breakneck maneuvers even during fierce storms. Eventually, the USO disappeared and the Navy abandoned the search. Where did it go? Most reports indicate it must have taken off into the sky and avoided the blockade altogether. So back when this happened, the idea of USOs was talked about, but it wasn't really acknowledged like it is today. And the idea that it could travel at breakneck speed under the water was acknowledged, but it really wasn't understood no, nor believed by many. Now, prior to this incident, other U-boats, Russian submarines, had broken into Norway's fjords. So they kind of got mad about it, and they said, that's it. Well, in reality, this one time, it did appear that it probably was not a submarine, but it was a USO. And I can remember I was riveted to the story when I first heard this about 15 years ago. Now, one of the things that I talk to you guys about in each of the UFO classes is the shape, size, the look of UFOs. Now, this is May 1974, Ontario, Canada. This is a little, little similar to a New Mexico sighting named by a New Mexico state trooper named Lonnie Zamora. And he saw a craft on the ground that had struts like that and reported it. And this, was a, this one is in 74 in Ontario. Now, this is Hasselback, Germany. Again, we've, we've talked about this before. These almost look like observational ports around the outside of the craft. A very unusual thing to see. And you really don't hear much about that these days. So, that was in Germany. This is 67 Detroit, Michigan. Kind of the same sort of thing around the outside. There was no mention of the size of this, but that'd be a lot of windows, right? And then one of the more unusual designs, Alvin, Texas, April 2008, kind of reminds me of a multi-story building, but Maybe it was a UFO that had multi-stories to it. Definitely had layers to it.
USOs. What I want you to take away from this, there's not a big difference between USOs, UFOs, and UAPs. I tend to believe that USOs can become UFOs. UFOs become USOs. If you watch the movie, I talked about USOs in the movie and how it would appear as though aquifers, underground water storage areas in the United States, could be hiding places for these UFOs, USOs. Because we've seen the UFOs and USOs condense down into very, very small items. We've seen them condense down so far they disappear. So if they have the ability to condense down in size, what's not to say they couldn't go down a well, which is something we talked about in this movie. We've been taught to think in very conventional physics terms. But what if physics really has a lot more to it than what we learn in school? And I tend to believe that's the case. Oh, that's Huck. That's actually a good sign. I didn't tell you guys this. A couple days ago, Huck got spayed. And the vet up here said we wanted her to go through one cycle of having her period and then have her have her wait a month and then we'd, we'd have her spayed. And uh, we just got her back this morning and uh, she's moving around pretty gingerly. And that is the first time I've heard her bark since she's been home. So I think that's a good sign. She, uh, when we took her out of the car, she, she winced just slightly because she had to take a step down. She's a good girl. And uh, otherwise she would have been in here to greet you, but she was sleeping and uh, she's got a big scar around the middle of her tummy right now. But she's gonna be okay, she's good. So anyhow, that was the USO UFO UAP class number three. Now I'm, I'm doing this with you to kind of give you the background and the history because as we move forward, all of this is going to come together in a way that you better understand. So you may think you know everything right now, but these stories in these locations are important and you're going to see why. So if you're the know-it-all, know everything about UFOs and what I'm telling you is just boring, I'm sorry because there's a lot of people that don't know. So bear with us and in the weeks to come I hope I'll I'll give you some new information that uh, will push your brain a little harder. But in the meantime if you could put this on your, your social media sites give it some uh, thumbs up, help Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Make sure you are subscribed. And if you haven't watched the movie, you can watch the movie on Amazon, iTunes, Vimeo. And uh, if you have a UFO, UAP, or USO story, send it to me. I want to hear it. And that's uh, my email is canammissing, like Canadian American, canammissing at yahoo.com. I'd appreciate it. In the meantime, do something nice for somebody out there in the world. There's a lot of people that need a smile, need a door open for them every once in a while. Do a good deed. Politis out.